Hello everybody. So today a video on embodiment and leadership. Again, I'm not an expert on embodiment, I'm an expert on leadership and I'm just going to make the connection here to a very interesting lecture by Professor Mark Johnson, um, who is a professor at the uh, Liberal Arts and Sciences in the Department of Philosophy in the University of Oregon. And I found this lecture online on language and embodied mind, which he gave to the School of Journalism. And he published uh, interesting books like Metaphors We Live By with uh, George Lakoff. And you'll find um, both these names, both these people uh, also giving lectures and uh, you can view them on YouTube. As usual, I'll link his original lecture down in the description. And um, Mark Johnson does not, in this lecture, make any statements on leadership. So that's my contribution. I always make that bridge from what others say about their domain into the domain of leadership. I just found it very, very interesting that I just stumbled across this lecture after talking to a um, trainer of emotional intelligence and leadership and uh, we both were in agreement that leadership does not function without the idea of embodiment. Which is strange because if you look at leadership theory and how leadership is being taught in general, if it is being taught at all, then embodiment plays hardly any role either in the theory or in the actual training of leadership. And I think this is a cardinal mistake. There are several reasons for this. Um, we'll get into the subject of embodiment right now, embodiment and cognition. And perhaps it's a little bit abstract, but I'll try to um, keep it real in terms of leadership. Just one example. Um, Without a body, you can't practice the art of leadership. It's just not possible. How are you going to do that? Now, and this is, again, quite mind-boggling when you think of what concepts are being taught um, in terms of behavioral th uh, theory or social science, that um, you actually need a body to do leadership. And not only that, what your body signals and does and how it uh, works and uh, the feelings and emotions, of course, play a huge role in that. And everybody who works in this field, in management or any sort of responsibility, of course, knows that. That's where all the mess starts, but also where all the potential is in the end. So let's jump right into this lecture and see what Mark Johnson has to say about embodiment and language and cognition. And I'll try to uh, comment on that and see what that could tell us in terms of leadership. So what I'm going to claim is that if you want to understand human meaning and communication and experience, cognition, values, you have to delve deeply into the body and the way the body engages its environment to see how meaning is built up from that and that this is a profoundly aesthetic undertaking. So that any theory of communication that is going to be workable has to be centrally focused on these kinds of phenomena I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> so I'm going to say the following. <clears throat> Instead of thinking of aesthetics as basically about aesthetic judgment and the nature of beauty and the nature of art, um, the way it's taught as an academic discipline in philosophy, I'm going to say that aesthetics concerns everything that goes into our ability to have meaning, to experience meaning and significance. And it, so it involves form and structure, the qualities that define the situations of our lives, our felt sense of the meaning of things, our rhythmic engagement with our surroundings, our emotional interactions and so forth. So I'm going to say meaning reaches down into the body and that aesthetics is about all of the ways in which meaning emerges for us. And it, I'm going to claim that 
it's important in art. We think of aesthetics and connect it with art because art is an exemplary manifestation of meaning making. And that's why we care about it when we do. So as he, he talks about aesthetics and I found it very interesting because there's this um, common perception that aesthetics is, uh, has to deal something, has to deal with the fact of something is pleasing or evokes some sort of emotions within us when we view it. And that's not the case according to his definition. He talks about aesthetics as the process of meaning making, which is essential to art. And I would claim also it's essential to leadership. I claim the whole point of leadership is meaning making for yourself and for others. One of the also interesting parts which he mentions here is that this is produced in constant interaction with the environment. And when I'm always confronted with this question that, well, where are the others? Where is the, where, where are, <laughs> where are other people? Well, they're always constantly there. You are always interacting with your environment. You're always interacting with other people. You're always in interacting with so the society and with culture. So that's a given. That's not even a question because that just shows how much the theory of leadership has been you know, degenerated because we're so used to looking at the um, the, the, the social relations between leaders and followers. And we, we try to infer some sort of knowledge from that, what leadership is supposed to be. Um, whereas we actually interact automatically all the time. And this interaction, as he points out, is something which is embodied. And um, you, you, and all these cognitive processes also deal with that interaction all the time. So um, it's, it's impossible to uh, not think about social interaction or, or behavior or relationships when talking about meaning making. They are part of meaning making. So when you interact with others, that is meaning making. So what I'm claiming is uh, no body, never mind. That mind is embodied. The grounding assumption of embodied cognition theory is that mind, meaning, thought, and value all arise from the ongoing interactions of a bodily organism with its environment. And that environment is at once physical, interpersonal, and cultural. And so the f everything rests on this that you start with an organism in ongoing interaction with an environment. And you don't take that as any kind of dualism. That's a, that's a fundamental structure and everything is gonna have to come out of that. Consequently, there's no disembodied meaning, no disembodied understanding, no disembodied reasoning. So there's no disembodied reasoning. So the, this lecture by Mark Johnson is very compact, okay? So you can just also watch it in full. What my point is here that, especially in leadership theory and leadership practice is, and also within uh, just the general workplace, if you see how people interact there and what they believe in um, what is rational thought and how it arises and how they utilize it, that uh, there is somehow this perception of duality, right? There's this like fundamental idea that the mind exists apart from the body and you can sort of manipulate the mind and train it to do whatever you'd like it to do. And it's just like this um, well-trained um, computer, let's say, and then you just run these scripts off the computer in the interactions with others. So you try to be as rational as possible and um, uh, that's how you uh, basically lead others, right? Through pure rational thought and uh, having the best arguments and the best possible analysis and so on and so forth. And then you're astonished to see that others um, are much better in appealing to, um, to people and convincing them of their side of the argument, although they might not have 
rationally and factually <laughs> the best arguments. And that then is very frustrating. Plus, there, there's another element there, which is, although you might have the best rational reasoning, um, it's, you still have a difficult time uh, convincing others to believe in what you're setting out to achieve and uh, supporting you in that. Um, so this is, this is a paradox or this is then, then a conundrum people find themselves often because they've been trained like that to think, well, as long as I train my mind in the most rational, rational uh, and most reasonable way, that will you know, give me also some leadership quality and convince others that I'm this very intelligent, reasonable person. However, uh, Johnson points out that actually even reason and rational thinking are not possible without embodiment. So embodiment is the, is the underlying pers uh, concept of rational thought. And we'll see later on how that, that emerges again. And um, there is also no rational thought without this organism, this, this biological organism with a body and a mind interacting with the, uh, with the environment. So all that is um, fundamental for understanding even cognition and understanding yourself, how you are actually thinking. And if, if that if you believe and uh, that you're just this rational thinking mind, then you you just have uncovered, you know, one small slice of your cognitive abilities. And Ian McGilchrist points out in terms of the left and the right hemisphere, that actually this notion that we are this, uh, this rational commutation machine is something which is being produced by the left hemisphere which is actually taking all this uh, more rich information, this embodied information from the right hemisphere. So we believe in that duality, but actually Johnson will point later on also this duality is actually a product of embodiment. When we study the brain to look for networks controlling cognition, we find that all of the networks that have been implicated in cognition are linked in one way or the other to sensory systems, to motor systems for movement, or to motivational systems. There are no brain parts for disembodied cognition. So that's the basic background for this. So what he's saying here is also so, so fundamentally important for cognition and also leadership. So in terms of reasoning or even Okay, let's say for some reason you have decided I'm this hyper rational person and I have to stay, you know, purely in this rational way of leadership. Even then you are activating networks which are, which are um, part of the sensory system or which are part of the motor system, which are part of um, the networks which are also connected to your body and which also then, then are um, responsible f for part of the sensory system and or how, how the body is being moved, which is the motor system. So that is also very interesting. So there is no disembodied con um, cognition, which means, uh, of course, it is part of your body anyway, your brain, but the idea that part of your brain could function without activating those networks is ludicrous, according to Mark Johnson. So meaning is relational. It's about how one thing, quality, or event relates to and evokes some other experience. It's cashed out experientially. In short, the meaning of something is what it affords you by way of experience. So this affords pickup ability, drink ability, throw ability, and such. So the meaning of that gets cashed out in terms of its, what Gibson called its affordances for us. And I'm not just saying perceptual affordances, but it has social roles, etc. <clears throat> and the water that's in it can be associated with religious rituals of cleansing or whatever. So the affordances are not just physical, sensory affordances. There were two parts here, which I think are also important for, for leadership. So what is happening in the meaning-making process is that some 
other experience is being activated. And um, uh, in this interview, with uh, which I didn't do, but which I commented on with the architect uh, Balakrishna Doshi, I'll just uh, put the link up there. I found it very interesting that some experiences which he had as a child are always active within his mind. So whatever he does, he seems to activate that experience. He seems to um, get an affordance, <laughs> as Johnson puts it, from doing those things to activate that, that uh, value structure. Um, just uh, as a short anecdote, he, um, he once went to, um, to, to, to an apartment of a very poor woman as a child and visited her and she was uh, complaining about being robbed and he saw that she actually had absolutely nothing, that we, she was very, very poor and this sort of shocked him to his core and um, strengthened his resolve even as a child to uh, do something about poverty. So whenever now he's doing his architecture, he is uh, projecting this value into his architecture. And so that um, every time he creates his architecture and he creates this meaning why he's doing that, he's activating that memory. So that is giving him some affordance of experience. Um, and there's another point Johnson makes out that meaning, meaning making always has to do with experience. So that's pretty important in terms of leadership again is that what experience are you creating for yourself and for others and this you got to really think about so as opposed to management which you say okay well maybe i'm giving this clarity of structure i'm communicating clearly what is expected of others i am setting realistic targets etc cetera, etc cetera. leadership is much more in creating that experience that meaning, that meaningful environment where others can have an experience, where this affordance of an experience is central. So uh, think about that. What experience are you um, enabling others to have? Because that's meaning creation. So what we have to understand is that most of the meaning we engage most of the meaning that goes on, most of the thought that goes on is not conscious and is not accessible by consciousness. Meaning operates within a vast, continuous, non-conscious or marginally conscious process of organism, environment, transactions. And it's going to involve images, patterns, qualities, feelings, emotions. Sometimes we conceptually, propositionally develop these meanings. But the big mistake is to take that as though that's what meaning is. And I want, this is the crux of everything I'm saying today. If you take that view, which is the view I learned as a graduate student, and I see pervasive, if you take that, that the locus of meaning is sentences, language, and all, you will never understand most of what human beings do. You won't understand art. You won't understand ritual practice. You won't understand music experience. You won't understand parts of poetry. You won't understand spontaneous gesture, and on and on. Because these are not propositional in structure. And he could also have added, and you will never understand leadership. <laughs> because most of uh, what is being taught in leadership is propositional. But back to, to, so, but, but back, back to what he was saying in the beginning of that, most of the meaning making is not done in the conscious but in the non-conscious part of the mind. So uh, also in terms of images, in sort of processes, in terms of structures and qualities, right, in sort of e-feelings, that is where meaning is already being produced, right? We are just then able to verbalize that and that's also what actually how speech and how um, conscious thought is being developed. Conscious thought is being developed on the basis of internal processes which are not linear necessarily and they're not um, spelled out in language. So that is just part of the part of cognition. So you could argue that most of the meaning making is even made before we talk about it. Okay, that, and that makes a lot of sense because 
especially when you're a person who likes to speak a lot, you will notice that there's an impulse to say something and then you just sort of like roll it out and then the words come from that point where you sense that you're trying to make make a point or an argument and you need time to do that because you're basically translating that thought into language and I also do another video on that where, where Steven Pinker talks about um, language and how language is being created why is this so important for leadership okay so we're we're ba human beings are you could say are like meaning making um, entities, uh, meaning making um, organisms, right? So they're constantly making meaning of what is happening around them. Um, not just in the immediate vicinity, but also, also in terms of um, the abstract uh, future. So all that plays into that meaning making process simultaneously. The, the challenge here being that uh, to become better at that meaning-making process is then you would have to look at those internal processes and become aware of them and also become aware of what you are actually projecting without being conscious about that. And we'll get about that in terms of body language just as one example, but I would argue that even um, you as a human being, how you talk, the inflection of your voice, uh, how, your, how your body is positioned, how you deal with people, already that projects your meaning-making process. And if you're not aware of that, and you don't know what effect you have on others, uh, that means you're, base, you're basically flying blind when you're doing leadership. You have no clue how your meaning-making process is affecting other people. And if they are activated by that, if they... Um, are experiencing something through this process or if they're experiencing nothing. And I argue, would argue most people don't have a clue what they're actually projecting, what space they are opening up for others and how others experience that uh, collaboration and that, um, that kind of relationship. So food for thought here. So meaning making and um, especially becoming aware of your own meaning-making process is, is a process of uh, self-discovery. Um, I want to give you some examples of this. So think of the ways your body engages its environment. You experience verticality. You experience containers. You experience things moving from a source along a path toward a goal. And you move your own body in that way to achieve purposes. You experience balance and loss of balance. You ha you, because of the way our bodies are, we have center and periphery, or center and horizontal character to our experience. It, and it's the result of the nature of our bodies and the nature of our environments. We have front, back, near, far, iteration. And Lakoff and I called all of these image schemas. And we, our claim is that this is meaning at the most primitive level. We're picking up on these structures that are meaningful for creatures like us, and they're shared by human beings. Now the claim is that these can be elaborated culturally so that you get differentiation, but that all around the world people make use of image schematic structure um, in their lives. And it shows up in their language and in their symbols, systems, etc. That's uh, already such a rich, short clip that it's going to be difficult for me to um, really comment all of that. Uh, he's already preparing us for the idea of metaphor and uh, I've done this reading on the work of Ian McGilchrist and uh, who claims that we first perceive the world in its metaphorical form and a metaphor and uh, Mark Johnson will explain that is very much tied to um, our, our body and how we experience the world as an embodied being. Um, furthermore, I, here's another video. Um, we did a video and we're, we're developing a, a practice on metaphorical thinking, which shows that people are generally more activated by metaphor. So when they hear a metaphor um, uh, as, as a proposition for a team, for a future, for a process, they're much more activated. They become very interested. They want to be part of that 
image of that image schema, as, as he calls these, um, these image schemas here. But let's say this metaphor is an image, and they want to be part of that, and they feel emotionally drawn into the, um, into the metaphor. So speaking of motivation, people who are actually interested in motivating others should think about these image schemas and metaphors. There's, there's another point I'd like to make here. If you look um, again back at these image schemas, which he's talking about, for example, verticality or containers and containers, he's going to go into a little bit more, um, but also iteration, all these um, yeah, ideas we have about reality, which spring from the experience of the body and then become abstract concepts, you could also say, and he mentions that, are highly symbolic. And you can activate also other people by using these symbols in, in how you address them and how you feel about them. This is central to what we're doing, for example. So everybody will understand that this is central, this is very important. Um, but if you say it, it's very important or it's central, it even makes now even makes, well, you will see that this makes emotionally quite a difference. Um, this, uh, so this, this verbalization in, 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 in using these, these schemas is important, but also even one step backward, how you perceive your environment is largely symbolic and based on these image schemas. Now that's hard to digest, but that's why symbols play such a big role in culture, because symbols are representation of those embodied image schemas. And I might do another video on, on symbols, because I find it interesting that we perceive the world first in its symbolic form. And um, this could also mean that our future possibilities or future possibilities are also largely first perceived in symbolic form because before we uh, verbalize them, right? So even your, yeah, your response to a future option could be something you feel symbolically, like this um, is, is, is something which has great potential. I feel this is like, um, this is like a small seed which I would just need to plant and you know, a big tree will, blow, will, 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 will grow out of it. That, that seed is something which you feel is symbolic. Um, so that's, that's several points which he's already making there in terms of um, embodied cognition. And I just wanted to draw your attention to image uh, schemas and um, symbols, in fact. There is an image schematic logic, which is to say there's already a kind of primitive reasoning at the corporeal bodily incarnate level for us. So transitivity of containment, the logical relation, is grounded in our experience of bodily containers. Now, how do we get to abstract concepts? Well, I've spent 30 years of my life, it may be embarrassing to say, figuring out, some, working on some of this, and one of the ideas we have is that we have basic conceptual metaphors in terms of which we structure our understanding. And these metaphors take a, a bodily and social source domain, like vision, let's say, and they, they um, map it onto a domain that we regard as more abstract. So we get a metaphor, something like understanding is seeing, as in I see what you mean. That was a, a cloudy uh, argument. Could you shed a little more light on what you mean by conceptual metaphor? And so those metaphors are not accidental, we're claiming. They're not arbitrary because they're motivated profoundly by our bodily engagement with the world and the way our bodies are, and our environments are structured. Yeah, there's two, two very important points here. One is this idea of concept and abstraction. So. You will get this a lot when you talk about embodied leadership. You will say, well, it's all very abstract, but we're dealing with these highly abstract deliberations, be it in mathematics or engineering or medicine. And he points out with a very simple example that um, even the idea of a concept is something which springs from this idea of embodiment because a concept is nothing more than a, a container for something, right? Which you can compare with other concepts. So there's something within that concept which is, has been abstracted, but there's something inside and you would, as we say, drill down and 
try to figure out what's inside of that concept. And this idea of container, again, springs from um, us having a body. So we can put things inside of our body, right? Or we could, we experience, um, you know, putting things inside of our pockets. Um, and we also experience ourselves being inside of uh, spaces and rooms. So there's already this fundamental bodily experience of container, of containment. And that is being shifted towards this idea of uh, concept, which then is a much more abstract term. But still, immediately we have a, one would argue, bodily sensation when uh, speaking about concepts, that we know that it contains something more than it just is, is written or verbalized at that moment. Now, and um, again, he talks about conceptual metaphors. Again, this, this mapping of um, bodily functions onto something else. Uh, he has for, for uh, I think he, he might be bringing later on an, uh, an example, and I'll just, just go into that. Um, you will all, you, you will notice, and we talk, I talked about that in the beginning, that just to address people purely rational and convince them through rational reasoning might not always yield the best possible results. Whereas when you go into some sort of um, rhetorics that all of that is always loaded with some uh, sensation. So uh, this is a hot moment or um, uh, this is a life and death situation or uh, we have to get our feet wet, right? So all that is already connected to the body and body, bodily sensation. And uh, that will stimulate much more the um, imagination of the people who you're talking to. So they get a feeling and sensation of what you're trying to achieve and why this is important to you as a person. Uh, and sometimes we lack that. We don't really know why um, that person is interested in achieving something and how that person is being you know, feels about that aspect. So that kind of language actually brings those feelings forward. So let me give you an example of this. Um, so I'm, we have a metaphor, we call it affection is warmth. I'm holding a baby and the baby experiences a kind of correlation, correlation between warmth and uh, affection. And we claim that experiences like that provide a bodily basis for um, a metaphor, what's called a primary metaphor by Joseph Grady. And, and so I can say, I received a warm reception in Norway. Um, our relationship has cooled off recently. That's a fundamental metaphor that you find in cultures around the world, affection is warm. Incidentally, um, to view leadership as an art form, uh, circumvents this whole problem of uh, uh, applying this idea within other cultural settings or even organizational cultures or other countries because each, uh, each um, culture has their own art and their own way of expressing uh, their values and this goes for any organization. So all these, you, you suddenly have you, none of those problems anymore because if you understand it as an art form, then it's automatically being adapted to whatever cultural setting um, you might find yourself in. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be another country or culture, it just can be a certain organization which also has a different kind of culture. He um, gives, uh, gives an example how this um, mapping of, uh, of bodily uh, functions and perceptions onto something else works in terms of uh, affection as warmth. And I, we had a warm reception there and everybody understands what that means when you talk about a warm reception, it means affectionate um, people who were very open, uh, sympathetic, uh, nice people. Uh, and all I need today is say it's, a, it's warm, right? So uh, it's, it's immediately understood. Um, and again, back to leadership, uh, if you say metaphorical thinking and metaphorical uh, speech is important in terms of leadership and activating others, then that's exactly why embodiment is important for leadership. Because if you're not able to connect that to yourself, 
to your own emotions, to your own body, to your own bodily sensations and um, express that, you are not able to use that because you are, you cannot communicate that. You really have to um, be yourself emotionally committed to that metaphor. I had this really warm reception and people feel that you're happy and uh, can uh, you know, have empathy with what you have experienced and be part of that experience. So I, I like that in terms of what, what he said in terms of affordance of experience. People want affordance of experience. They always want to have an experience. They want to feel something. Um, <laughs> I don't know how often I, I need to say that. So um, it's, it's really, really simple. So if leadership is an art form, you are giving this affordance of experience to other people. Your, through your interactions, through your behavior, through your relationships, through your communication. And you're aware that uh, because you have a body, <laughs> you're using these bodily sensations and metaphors to do that. Let me point to this one and then I'll give you some examples of this. So one of our most basic metaphors is organization is physical structure because physical structures manifest functional organization. So there's an experiential correlation. And notice, as soon as you get a metaphor structure like this, you can take any physical object and relationships and use that metaphorically to understand abstract reasoning, understanding, inference drawing, etc. So remember the container schemas. A is in can, B is in C. Well, that can if you understand categories as cont metaphorical containers, then you can use category logic for doing Aristotelian syllogisms and such. And so the claim is that we can build, that we can look at any abstract process, cognitive process, and we, we'll, we'll find metaphors that let us build up the meaning, not top down, but from the bottom up. Again, there's so much in there. Um, he claims that um, you look at any abstract concept and you can discover the, uh, the metaphors which helped construct that. And here, because we're talking about management and leadership, it's so, so interesting that he mentioned this, this uh, aspect of organization is, is a physical structure. And anybody who um, worked in an organization or uh, has uh, worked uh, in management or leadership or consulting or whatever it is, institutions, of course we have that mental image schema of that um, organizational chart, of that hierarchy up and down. Um, and it's it's very very difficult. Just try if you if that you don't feel that this is a physical structure that this is very much um, related to your experience of um, physical objects of uh, up and down of uh, things which are built one on top of the other. Although in terms of organization, that is simply not the case. That is not what is actually happening, <laughs> even if the CEO has, has, uh, has his or her office in the top floor. But it's not like you have these individual people standing like in this pyramid, one on top of the other. That's not what really what's happening. Um, but we feel very strongly that's what it is and that's how we see it. And also we sense even its inflexibility in terms of those uh, organizational structures that there's something um, not very fluid about them, very static even. So and that, of course, is derived also from the sensation that it's a physical structure. Now, um, let me end this part by saying, give me, I'm pointing out that metaphor is not just a linguistic device. It's not just a poetic device. It's a fundamental device of our, of our making sense of things. And it's, people did, research on spontaneous gestures, and I think this is kind of fascinating. So um, um, Dave McNeil at the University of Chicago is one of the uh, founders of this kind of research. And he says, look, there are three kinds of gestures. There are beat gestures, and they take, this is my interaction space right here. And, and the beat gestures tend to take place down here, and they emphasize things. And so you should pay attention to what I'm about to say, that kind of thing. Then there are iconic gestures. 
And these are gestures in which, uh, he, I'll give you an example. They showed kids Tweety Bird and Sylvester cartoons. And then they had them describe what they saw. And, the, and uh, they, they say, they do this. They say, now Sylvester was climbing up the downspout and Tweety Bird took a bowling ball and dropped it down the downspout into, and, and, and pushed Sylvester out. Now notice, those are iconic gestures. And why do they do this for Sylvester? Because you, they could do this, but what are they modeling there? The downspout. And why, when they drop the bowling ball, it's not drop the bowling ball, it's drop the bowling ball, because that's the bowling ball. And dropped it down from up and all of that. Those are iconic gestures. Um, now, then, then there are metaphoric gestures. And so you say, she couldn't decide whether to go out with him. On the one hand, God, he, he was a hunk. But he was dumb as a stone. <laughs> and what are you doing? What's the metaphor? Balancing. Yeah, weighing. Judging is weighing. We, and you, you can see someone do that. And you may think, well, that's in ordinary discourse and all. But McNeil has videotapes he made 20 years ago of, of mathematicians at the University of Oklahoma looking at um, complex set theory stuff and complex variables. And he sh he's got them um, showing all the metaphoric gestures they use to talk about rings and sets and these complexes. Um, and I, if I had more time it, you, to talk about it, I would point out one thing. And that is that oftentimes, what the, there, he has cases where what people do with their hand gestures is what they're really trying to get at. What they say is mistaken. <laughs> So the gestures are not following after. In fact, they usually precede by a few milliseconds the spoken words. And they're not just illustrating them. They have a logic to them. So here's another point in terms of embodiment, which is uh, perhaps uh, even more clear. Think about what he said about gestures, that they precede the spoken word by a few milliseconds. Okay. So what happens in that moment? Um, I always say <laughs> the body cannot lie. So even though you will try uh, and even be trained in this to control your body, to always keep your hands at your side and uh, just speak as this rational person, um, which uh, is following pure logic and thus is trying to convince others, Sometimes you will be still gesturing and your gestures will actually reveal your real thoughts, your real reasoning. <laughs> so, which um, again, when you come back to leadership theory and leadership training, which usually works through this uh, principle of ethics and um, these principles of uh, behavioral science and social science that yes, we, expect our leaders always to treat everybody with respect and this and that. So what people will do, they will, they will adopt this kind of behavior, which they believe is the behavior, for example, of treating everybody with respect, whereas their body language is actually signaling total disrespect <laughs> for other people, which creates even more confusion because you have this smiling uh, face in front of you and um, but at the same time, you notice that there's no, there's no gestures which express that, which don't express that concern or that politeness or that respect because it's just not there because the values are not there within that person. It's just something very, which has been rudimentally trained onto somebody to obfuscate their real uh, personality. So that's very bad in terms of leadership. This is a total catastrophe. <laughs> First of all, you get all the wrong people. You get all these sociopaths, which pretend to be something, but are actually something quite different. Um, and you get those poor souls who really try to do the best possible job. And uh, because they don't know better, try to start learning this kind of um, dysfunctional behavior. Um, so gestures precede speech by milliseconds and reveal who you actually are. The body cannot lie and does not lie and reveals your values and your intentions anyway. So it doesn't matter if you try to conceal them, they're revealed. Uh, another aspect of embodiment is I'm always astonished that some people, because they've been too many years in university or I don't know what, 
have a real problem when it comes to uh, going into some physical exercise, yeah, or um, yeah, to 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 uh, stand in front of some people and uh, just be themselves. You know, all these they they feel ashamed suddenly. They become self-conscious and self-aware. Um, and the sense of shame and, and uh, you know, saying, oh, this is too stupid, this is, feels silly, right, is astonishing because they're doing this every day. You're, you are presenting yourself in your function every day in front of others who are looking at your whole body. They're not just like closing their eyes and listening to your voice. Um, but they're looking at your facial, facial expression, they're looking at your whole body, what does it express, what does it stand for, uh, and that's what they respond to. So this idea that leadership training and development uh, could happen without any physical <laughs> preparation or exercises is, is crazy. It's just, I don't know where that's coming from or where we are right now in this point of uh, history, but it's just, it just, uh, it's just uh, ludicrous. So embodiment matters in different uh, areas. So even if you say, well, the cognitive side, when it need to get into the theory, okay, but you know, even if it's that one bit that the body does not lie and that it reveals your true intentions and um, should give you food for thought. And I'm saying, no, what is more meaningful? What could possibly be more meaningful then your body's affective engagement with its environment because it is telling you, as I would say, how things are going for you right now. All right, so this is, this is his theory and I'm, gonna cu I'm cutting to the chase. I'm saying emotions lie at the heart of our ability to make sense of our world and to act intelligently within it. They're a fundamental part of meaning and if you leave that out, you're not gonna understand the. Uh, how meaning operates for us. Yeah, so um, emotion is a, is a fundamental part of the meaning-making process, which brings me again to organizations and groups and, and uh, corporations and uh, corporate work, where very often emotion is scorned uh, as something superfluous and we shouldn't show emotions um, and people get hurt by uh, seeing certain feelings, whereas it's really something which is essential for the meaning-making process to feel something um, which you experience. So whatever you feel has some, um, some meaning in, in, in the context which, which you're in, in those relations, in that future which you aspire to achieve. Plus for the others which are working with you also their, um, their experience is, is filled with emotion. So to give that, again, coming back to this idea of the space, space of possibilities within yourself and that which you project and make available to others to experience, to have also an emotional experience with you as a person and with their work and what they're achieving is, is, is fundamental. There is, there's no way around that. If you want to enter into this world of meaning making, you, you cannot leave emotions at the door. It's impossible. Now, I want to say that any theory of meaning and communication and language is going to have to account for that. That's just chock full of meaning. And it cannot do it in terms of propositions and concepts. That's a part of it. But you have to have an understanding of all of these dimensions of bodily meaning. Um, so I'm suggesting that an adequate theory of communication um, is going to have to be grounded in a, um, an adequate account, embodied account of cognition, of meaning, of understanding. I didn't mention values, but they're at the heart of everything that's going on here because the body is a valuing organism. It's, it's chock full of values that determine what can be meaningful to it, what it pursues, et cetera, and how it does that. At the end, he goes into values. In the next clip, we'll go into values again. Um, they are, of course, also at the heart of leadership theory, right? So there is, I, th I don't think there's any theory which would dispute the importance of values. And again, it's, uh, if you look around in the workplace, it's, this is always the question. What, what values do we have? What do we aspire to be? Um, who are we? 
What do we base our decisions on? And it's very, very often treated as an abstract concept. It's very often treated as something, oh, we just write down what we believe to be right, which is uh, valuable, and that's it, that's fine, we just talk about it. But that's, as you also will know from, uh, from your own experience, that means absolutely nothing. It's completely meaningless. Uh, because what actually means is this how people embody these values and you won't even use the words embody it because um, their decisions are steered by that their behavior is steered by that so you, you'd like to find those people who for some mysterious reason are driven by these uh, higher more universal values who had uh, like uh, the architect by Krishna Doshi, some experience as a childhood which shaped their value structure in such a way that they said, said this is very, very important to me. This, this gives me some, some important experience to, to have that value acted out. Um, and this is also a value which is not just uh, important for me, but also for larger groups of people. So those kind of people are the people you would like to have uh, and to work with. And those are the kind of people you need uh, within your organization because um, they embody that and others see this. And uh, this will also activate them in um, expressing those values. So, um, yeah, and, oh, in, the, in the beginning, I, I just wanted to mention that he's referencing a, a, a movie, Singing in the Rain, where... Uh, Gene Kelly is uh, performing his dance, and uh, that's what he means, chock full of value, uh, chock full of meaning, right? So that uh, how, how actors express themselves is not just through um, having a rational dialogue. It's, it's really through their whole body, through their whole being. Um, all of our values are going to emerge from what? patterns of organism environment and action, but our, our environments include other people. So you're going to have to, you're going to, you can say there are going to be these um, dimensions of values. So we're going to have some values that are critical for our immediate physical survival. Then we're going to have values that emerge from the fact that we're, we're profoundly interpersonal beings um, in a kind of um, um, primary intersubjectivity with one another. And then you're going to have values that emerge at the level of ourselves as interacting in larger communal groups. And you're going to have values that have to do with the fact that we're meaning-making creatures. So I have to tell, I'm, I'm not going to do it right now. I, I mean, I can't just put, lay this out there. But I'm going to have to tell, on my account, a story of how those levels emerge. And, you know, and then you have to say, here's what guilt means there. Um, here's, 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 here's the structure of that um, and show how it's connected to these, I, I, I just described four levels of complex interactions. So that's, that's really a wonderful last clip here, uh, how values emerge in individuals and uh, that, yes, they're not only that which uh, is deemed uh, necessary for survival of the body and its uh, immediate um, utility, um, but also in, uh, in a social context, in, a, in, uh, in, in, in being socialized into, into a culture. So all that and plays a huge role. I think what is um, important is what values are important to you as an individual and to discover that and um, build on this consciously. Because what you will discover, of course, is that many people will tell you, well, what you're doing is wrong or what you believe is in wrong. And um, what you actually believe in, you don't, well, it's, it's, it's certain fundamental values are so important for certain individuals that they don't have a choice but believe in that. So, uh, I would argue that it's important for every individual, especially uh, in a position of responsibility, to become very self-aware of those fundamental values which you are projecting, which you are acting out, which you are believing in, which can um, have uh, been created through any of those processes which Mark Johnson just uh, just laid out there. 
uh, again, the, the most important thing is that uh, this, this aspect of self, um, uh, self-awareness. And that's where this whole idea of mindfulness comes in, yeah, and personal and self-development in terms of leadership. Um, here, just um, uh, we, 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 here we just see the uh, theoretical background, the, where, where it comes in terms of cognition and embodiment and emotions. So again, the question, what do you feel strongly about? Um, yeah, so that was, um, I thought it would be a much shorter video. It's now has become again a longer video about embodiment, uh, values, leadership and meaning and why a good leadership theory and any sort of leadership development program has to look at the question of embodiment. What do you embody? It's a very, very simple and profound question and really very worthwhile exploring. Thanks for listening. I hope to see you in the next video.